Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Hit that like button, subscribe, do all the good stuff to feed the algorithm gods, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about today is an absolutely crazy story with Brendan Schaub. Uh, some of you know him as a former UFC star, others a uh, comedian, podcaster. But he's in the news today, and he's actually now talked about this story on his podcast right about a week ago, saying that on August 12th, around 7 p.m., he was in his car when he reportedly saw an 18-wheeler and a mangled 2003 Lincoln that was in involved in a serious accident. Shop reportedly saying he saw a child sitting on top of the vehicle screaming for assistance. He pulled over, immediately rushing over to the car to help. Brendan also noting that while he was doing this, there was a shoeless man running away from the smashed up car. When he got to the wreck, reportedly the, the big rig's gas tank was punctured. There was gasoline spilling all over the road, so he acted fast, busting out the window, removing and rescuing the kids from the car. And to put it plainly, Brendan Schaub is a bamf from this, but there, there's also a really dark and horrifying and, and just disgusting aspect to this story. Brendan explaining that the kid's mom who was sitting in the front was dead when he arrived. And as it turns out, it was later found out that that shoeless man was the 31 year old father of the kids who was actually driving the car with the family inside and has now been charged with murder, attempted murder, child abuse, assault with a deadly weapon, and resisting arrest, according to CBS News. And according to reports, he was not seriously injured in the crash. He was combative with cops, and according to law enforcement, he had to be tased. And with this, uh, the family has started a GoFundMe. So far, it's raised over $46,000. But also, with that, the fundraiser's profile gives us another heartbreaking aspect to this story. Explaining that the woman who died, this mother, was Amy Garcia. She's leaving four beautiful children all under the age of eight behind. Saying she was a loving, caring mother who unfortunately was the victim of domestic violence for many years. And yesterday, the aggressor fulfilled his objective and entered the freeway the wrong way, intentionally killing her. Thank God the children are fine but very traumatized. And with this story, I'm gonna link to the GoFundMe down below, but I don't even know how to end this story because obviously one aspect of this is Brendan Schaub is a BAMF. He is a hero for this. But also it's ultimately a story about a woman who has been murdered. It's a story about four kids who are now orphaned. It's just stories like this that, that break your heart and also kind of break your brain, just trying to even understand that level of a monster. How is a human capable of doing something like this? But yeah, that is where this one ends for now. Then, I don't even know how to transition away from that story. Then we have uh, other news involving Johnny Depp and Amber Heard back in the news, which I will say there, there's so much to this story of years and years of legal stuff, uh, accusations, other information, uh, but the update today involves two lawsuits. Right, so the first is a libel suit that Johnny Depp filed in the UK against the tabloid The Sun after the outlet called him a wife beater in one of their reports. Now, Depp actually ended up losing that case last year, then again losing a bid to overturn it earlier this year with a court saying that The Sun's claim was quote, substantially true, which then brings us to the second case, which involves an op-ed that Amber Heard wrote for the Washington Post back in 2018 called, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. And while she never specifically mentioned Depp by name, as she legally could not due to her ongoing divorce settlement, people still knew what she was referring to. She was referring to Johnny Depp and the domestic abuse allegations from their marriage. And with that, Depp responded with a $50 million defamation lawsuit in Virginia and heard that not only hit back with her own $100 million countersuit, but also argued that based on the UK's ruling about the article in The Sun, that this defamation suit involving her op-ed should be tossed out. With her legal team arguing that the UK's ruling established that what Heard wrote was true that Depp did commit domestic violence and therefore as a matter of law, Depp cannot prevail on any of his claims and Depp's complaint against Miss Heard should be dismissed in its entirety. Which now brings us to today's news, which is actually a win for Johnny Depp. And this because a judge in Virginia has now decided that Depp could continue the lawsuit and refuted Heard's arguments as why this should be dismissed. With a judge essentially writing that these cases are different and should be treated as such, saying, the son's interests were based on whether the statements the newspaper published were false. Defendants, AKA Heard's interests relate to whether the statements she published were were false. Although the claims are similar in the sense they both relate to claims of abuse by plaintiff, AKA Depp, the statements being defended in the UK case are inherently different than the statements published by defendant. And also adding that Heard wasn't even a party in the UK case. Right, so with this, you had Depp's lawyers giving a statement to Deadline saying, Mr. Depp is most gratified by the court's decision. But if you are someone out there that has been hoping for a quick resolution, that, that's not gonna happen. This turns into another waiting game because the matter is not actually set to even go to trial until 2022. Then we had an update on the T-Mobile data breach that we covered earlier this week. Of course, uh, reports earlier saying that it seemed like maybe a hundred million people's data was out there. T-Mobile has now responded essentially saying, hey, wait, 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 it's not a hundred million. That's crazy. It's 47 million. Well, reportedly their investigation is still ongoing. You had The Verge reporting. The data in the stolen files contain critical personal information, including first and last names, 
dates of birth, social security numbers, and driver's license slash ID numbers. So you know, kind of important information, especially if you want to steal someone's identity. But don't worry, according to that same report, T-Mobile says it will publish a dedicated website with information for customers later today, and they're offering two years of free identity protection services from McAfee. Also, if you're someone that's like, oh man, I used to have T-Mobile, I don't now, <laughs> lucky me. Reportedly, just over 40 million of the accounts in question are past or prospective customers who have applied for credit with T-Mobile. So yeah, uh, fun times. But from that, I wanna take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, HelloFresh. Now, HelloFresh is an awesome home delivery service that makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and prepping so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or even quicker with their quick and easy options. Personally, this has been so convenient for my family during the work week when life can get more hectic than usual. Right, having pre-portioned ingredients means cooking takes less time. And with more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, these meals are delicious. It's honestly a no brainer. And you can easily change your delivery days or food preferences, skip a week whenever you need to and more. Feeding the whole family has never been easier with larger box sizes for more servings and more savings. Also, you know, I love partnering with sponsors who focus on giving back. So it's great to know that HelloFresh has donated over 4 million meals to charity in 2020 alone and is continuing food donations amid the ongoing pandemic. So what are you waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com and to use code DeFranco14 to get 14 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com and use code DeFranco14 to get started today. Then let's talk about this batch of news coming out of Texas, starting with Greg Abbott, who of course, after pushing for weeks to keep local governments and school districts from implementing simple and safe mask mandates, tested positive for COVID-19. And that was notable for a few reasons. One, Monday night, Abbott was seen at a campaign event where around 100 people attended. Most, if not nearly everyone was maskless, including Abbott. Two, yet a spokesperson confirming that also means that Abbott is now quarantining. And while Abbott has not publicly changed course on his position around mask mandates, he did release a video yesterday stressing the importance of getting vaccinated. Also want you to know that I have received the COVID-19 vaccine, and that may be one reason why I'm really not feeling any symptoms right now. I have no fever, no aches and pains, so other types of symptoms. And Abbott is reportedly receiving Regeneron's monoclonal antibody treatment, right? The, the same treatment that former President Trump received last year after he tested positive. Which is also part of the reason why so many people have been pointing a finger at Abbott, either this one or this one. With people pointing out that Abbott is a man who has already gotten three vaccine shots, something not readily available to the general public right now. He also is getting monoclonal antibodies and he is also threatening to sue schools that require masks for children who are too young to be vaccinated and cannot afford monoclonal antibody treatment. Which is also something if FDA is only authorized for those with high risk for progression to severe COVID-19. All while he's not even showing symptoms right now. So people are saying it's so obvious that Abbott understands how scary this is, right? And this is also while Texas itself is not doing well. New cases and hospitalizations are skyrocketing. There's a shortage of ventilators and ICU beds in many parts of the state. Hospitals are worried that they're soon not gonna be able to handle the surge. And meanwhile, deaths are mounting so much that like we talked about, mortuary trailers have been requested. Yet yesterday, you still had Attorney General Ken Paxton asking the state Supreme Court to ban school districts from imposing mask mandates. And of note there, while a number of school districts are simply in open rebellion, another has seemingly found a legal loophole against the ban. With that school district, Paris ISD, saying that it's revising its student dress code to specifically include masks with that district writing. Nothing in the governor's executive order states he has suspended chapter 11 of the Texas Education Code. And therefore, the board has elected to amend its dress code consistent with its statutory authority. To which I imagine any girl that's been pulled out of class for spaghetti straps was like, that's what we've been saying. Just do that. But, but of course, it's not just Texas where schools are fighting to require masks. Yesterday, we also saw the Florida Board of Education voting to sanction two school districts for defying Governor Ron DeSantis' executive order banning mask mandates. However, there, the actual penalties against those districts have not yet been determined. Though, in the event that money is taken away from the districts, the Biden administration has already suggested that the federal government will step in to spot the difference. But whatever the case, in both states, you have many schools fighting back desperately right now against their governor's orders in an attempt to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 among a largely unvaccinated population as in-person classes get underway. Then, with the fall of Afghanistan unfolding this week, you know, let's talk about one of the main questions that we've seen out there, which is how do refugees fleeing for their lives actually get out? And where will they go? Right in there, for many, the first step is to simply go to the airport in Kabul. But the problem is there is no simply about it. Well, the Taliban promised yesterday to provide safe passage to civilians attempting to flee through the airport. We've already seen multiple reports of the Taliban turning away, pushing back, and even beating people that are trying to cross a checkpoint to the airport. Though you also have National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan saying that most people are actually getting through without issue and adding, we are taking that up in a channel with the Taliban and trying to resolve those issues. And we are concerned about whether that will continue to unfold in the coming days. Also notably, evacuation flights, like I mentioned yesterday, 
they resumed at the airport yesterday, but most Afghans are still going to find themselves unable to leave the country, with a majority of people in the country not having passports or visas. But that said, U.S. Army Major General Henry Taylor has said that the U.S. has a goal of evacuating 5,000 to 9,000 people daily. Also noting that about 4,000 U.S. troops are currently stationed in Kabul to help with the evacuation efforts. Meanwhile, another 2,000 will be sent there this week. However, the clock is ticking for a number of reasons, but also because President Biden has been adamant about pulling out all troops by the end of the month. Also, regarding refugees, there have been a question about how many people are going to be sent to the U.S. as opposed to other countries. There, you have the Pentagon suggesting that number could be around 22,000. Though, there we've seen progressive politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, and Ilhan Omar all suggesting or outright stating that the U.S. should accept every refugee seeking asylum here. Also, you've got people like Governor of Utah, Republican Spencer Cox, saying that a state is eager to assist with the resettlement of individuals and families fleeing Afghanistan. We've also seen Camp McCoy in Wisconsin, Fort Bliss, in Texas and Fort Lee and Virginia, all being listed as potential shelters for those thousands of refugees. Though, of course, with this, we've also seen the rise of anti-refugee sentiment. But also, with everything so up in the air, we've also seen people outside of the government trying to step up to help any way they can. That, including Tommy Marcus, who's better known online as the meme artist Quentin Quarantino. In fact, Marcus set up a GoFundMe titled Fly Away Emergency Afghan Rescue Mission, which has now collected over $5 million in just under 24 hours. With Marcus saying, we are coming to you in desperation to conduct an emergency flight rescue of 300 plus Afghan souls. I've been working alongside humanitarian aid groups, decorated military veterans, and activists on the ground in Kabul, fighting to save people who otherwise had no chance at survival in the Taliban-occupied Kabul. And specifically here, Marcus is saying that he's trying to evacuate people at imminent risk of being executed by the Taliban. For example, human rights lawyers, champions of women's and LGBTQ plus rights, journalists, government liaisons, artists, interpreters, etc. And while originally Marcus said 300 people would be distributed throughout two flights totaling $550,000, with that goal now absolutely shattered, Marcus said yesterday in an update that the planes are on standby and waiting to head out, saying there are enough people in need to make many round trips with our two airplanes. We will continue multiplying as goals are met. With Marcus adding that any overages and funds raised beyond flights will be donated to the International Women's Media Foundation. And obviously, I'm linking to that GoFundMe down below, but you know, with all of this, it highlights not only how desperate some people are to flee Afghanistan, but also the lengths that people are taking to make sure that those people get the opportunity. But I think for a lot of people, it just feels dire and hopeless. Also, on the topic of Afghanistan, there is a potential reckoning for Joe Biden around the corner. Right, well, President Biden, while he was speaking to the American people on Monday, said that all of this unraveled faster than he expected. And prior to that, saying that he found it unlikely that Kabul would fall quickly. We've seen some big reports since come out, including from the New York Times reading, intelligence warned of Afghan military collapse despite Biden's assurances. With the Times reporting that classified assessments by American spy agencies over the summer painted an increasingly grim picture of the prospect of a Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and warned of the rapid collapse of the Afghan military. Adding that by July, many intelligence reports reports grew more pessimistic, questioning whether any Afghan security forces would muster serious resistance and whether the government could hold on in Kabul, the capital. With the Wall Street Journal also reporting on this, saying that several administration and defense officials said Biden's decision to bring home U.S. troops was made against the recommendations of his top military generals and many diplomats who warned that hasty withdrawal would undermine security in Afghanistan. Right, and the big focus here is on what Biden was saying publicly, because understand, intelligence agencies have long predicted an ultimate Taliban victory, even before President Donald J. Trump and Mr. Biden decided to withdraw forces. What is called into question, though, once again, is what Biden was saying publicly as well as the timeline. So even after the end of this month, you should expect this Afghanistan story to still be in the news. With, among other things, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan saying that they're going to conduct what they refer to as a hot wash. Or to look at every aspect of this from top down. But ultimately, with this story, really anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But yeah, as always, thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, being a part of the family. My name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.